if you talk to my parents or people that are older, like 60s or 70s or 80s, they will say Canada is nothing like it used to be at all, like not even close uh, at anywhere. And, and trying to get hired full time is virtually impossible. Like they, you know, they want they you, you're, you're working at their hours and you have to be on call all the time. It, that's it's been my experience with virtually any work position these days. But it's been like that since I was in my late teens. It's not much to do with with with, with the current uh, administration in, in Canada. It, it, the politicians have been abusing us for a very long time. It's good. It's good for acute issues. It's good. It's we should call it sick care, not health care. We should call it sick care because it's only when mainly when you get sick. It's then it's mainly based on acute issues. You wouldn't you wouldn't realize, but you might need more vitamin C. That need more of these nutrients than you can get by mouth. We don't realize that. I didn't re really realize that. So the Western world is. There's too much bureaucracy involved in everything, and the, the, the banks are—they're not encouraging—they're not encouraging saving. They've been encouraging spending consumption for the past 25 years since around 9/11. In the Western world, but in Canada especially, it's a very, in my opinion, it's a very anti-human environment. They've been doing this for a long time. They they they, they over they overregulate, they overtax, they they take it, they don't pay you any interest in the bank. Uh, you're you're basically living hand to hand to mouth, and it's it, and you get sick. You're gonna get sick, and then when you go to the doctor, you get sicker. And the food we have is expensive. It's not available. I can say 90% of the people have no idea what they're drinking, right? Even from the bottled water that you buy from the store, that's also garbage. Countries like Canada, where their currency is not the global reserve currency, we are at the mercy of the foreign exchange market, right? So, and we're seeing because of all these economical issues, lower GDP and and high deficit spending the Canadian dollar is keep falling against USD. And that is also basically affecting our quality of life here because everything gets expensive and your currency gets cheaper against the other currencies because we import a lot of stuff here, right? And we pay uh, in terms of the exchange that is set by the, by the market. And if you look at Canadian dollar, it's keep falling. It's keep falling against USD. And I think it is expected to keep fall because of all the economical issues we have. All right, everybody, thanks for joining in. Today, I have invited uh, a very unique guest, uh, I should say, compared to my previous guests on the podcast. And uh, we just want to understand what's happening in Canada from his lens, because a lot of people, you know, they tell me that I'm bashing Canada, I'm anti-Canada. That's certainly not true. I always try to bring some subjects which nobody actually talks about at, at, on the mainstream media. And we try to, you know, discuss those challenges and try to find solutions. Uh, but, you know, I, I met Dave through uh, social media and then he reached out to me and he wanted to share his story. And we wanted to learn from him how, uh, you know, he has grown up in Canada, born in Canada, educated in Canada, but then he finally decided to leave and now living in Ecuador. So uh, let's understand his story and then uh, put your comments down below. If you have any questions, let me know and we will try to answer them as well. So without further ado, hi Dave, how's it going? Oh, it's wonderful. How are things going there? <laughs> not bad, not bad. Summer is always good in Toronto, so I always enjoy summer and uh, patiently wait for, for the winter coming in, so it's, uh, no complaints. How's things in Ecuador? Uh, some things are good, some things are bad. It's not perfect anywhere, but uh, there's a lot of people that think that, well, not a lot, but there's some people that, that think that if they just get get out of the situation that they're in that is going to magically get better i said no it's not yeah, yeah exactly yeah no nowhere is perfect i think you have to compromise on some things um okay dave so you reach out to me uh after watching my channel and and as people watch that you know i always bring some guests some interesting guests to understand their story in terms of um their struggle their entrepreneur journey and i wanted to understand you know from dave's story as well you know how he started his whole you know, new gig in terms of become a, a solopreneur and how he's helping other people struggling with health issues. So we're going to talk, talk about that as well. But before that, I wanted to understand what actually made him to leave Canada after, you know, living here for pretty much all his life. Um, you know, leaving a country where you have born and raised, it's not easy. I mean, I'm an immigrant. I know that this was very difficult. Uh, I was born in Pakistan. When I left Pakistan, I was 22 years old. I left my parents, my siblings, my cousins, my friends. There's a lot of memories attached to a place where you are born, and it's not easy. Okay, you, people have have to make very difficult decisions to leave the country, and they only do it when they have no choice. Okay, so let's let's understand from Dave's story. You know what was those factors that actually pushed him to make that decision? Yeah. My if you talk to my parents or people that are older, like 60s or 70s or 80s, they will say Canada is nothing like it used to be at all, like not even close. So I've, I've been trying to get out of Canada for the past 15 years. Uh, so I have, I've had 
uh, transient health problems that I didn't know what to do about. And so that's what I'm specializing in now. But Canada has been for since I've been around, you know, I'm 44 and I was born in 80. So since I was in my early, late, late teens, you, you try to get work at a, at a, at anywhere and, and trying to get hired full time is virtually impossible. Like they, you know, they want they you, you're, you're working at their hours and you have to be on call all the time. It, that's, it's been my experience with virtually any work position these days, but it's been like that for, since I was in my late teens. So, uh, we didn't, I, I don't think Canada relied so much on, on schools, uh, to do all the training for the employers. It was mostly employer led, I think. So, and, and the rent was much more, the, the, the value of the currency was, was much more, was much higher. The purchasing power is much higher 40 years ago. So once, once they delinked it from, from gold, from like precious metal standards, that's where it's it started to fall off the cliff. So that's, that's a big issue. And it's, I didn't realize it until I was in my late twenties, all these details and mm-hmm. studying these things in university. So, and like I said, talk to older people and they'll say, it's nothing to do. It's not, it's not much to do with, 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 the, with the current uh, administration in, in Canada. It, it, the politicians have been abusing us for a very long time. That's exactly true. I mean, a lot of people accuse me that I'm, you know, pro liberal or pro NDP because a lot of my content is criticizing current government policies, but that is certainly not true because I always try to, first of all, I'm apolitical. I, 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 I consider all politicians cut from the same cloth. You know, they always try to sell you the same stories, same promises, but when they come into power, they exactly do the same thing. Uh, but what I try to do is I try to highlight the the issues in the policies and how this is having uh, a, a cascading effect upon all of us in Canada. And the only purpose uh, for me to bring in these issues up is to basically discuss them. You don't find them being discussed at the mainstream media and find some solution. Maybe, you know, we can do something to bet to get our lives better somehow. So that's the only purpose. So, so Dave, uh, thanks for sharing this. Let's, let's understand, you know, uh, where were you born? Where were you raised? Uh, what's your professional background? And, and I understand, you know, finding, uh, you know, career opportunities in Canada has never been easier. When I was, you know, moving to Canada, uh, one of my close friends was moving to U.S. In, in California because we were both in tech. And he was telling me, you know, hey, consider again, because you're, li- you're moving to Canada, you don't have a lot of opportunities there. So, you know, you may have to reverse your decision and, and, and move to U.S. at some point. I said, OK, we'll find we'll find out, you know, when, when, when I get there. But, you know, he was true. When I compare my, my myself with my friends and, and colleagues who moved to U.S., they're far ahead in terms of their pro- professional uh, career uh, compared to myself. Uh, so that's because you know, there's a lot of opportunities in the U.S., the pay scale, the taxes. The, you know, there's, there's a huge difference in terms of when, it, when you compare the ecosystem between the two countries. Uh, but, but let's just uh, you know, get into your professional background in terms of you know, um, you, where you were born, where were you raised, uh, what was your professional background, your studies, um, and then how you get into this whole health thing uh, that I wanted to understand. In my, in my late teens, I was working at a grocery store part time. So I, I became interested. I was always interested in, in, in computers, like in information technology. You could almost say it was the, the younger people were they, they there was a whole propaganda campaign f- from like uh, Microsoft and all these companies to uh, get uh, uh, to get people into information technology. So I thought that was the issue. I thought that was my path. But then I started realizing when I started going to school, I, I, I enrolled in general studies, I political th- science, these types of studies. And I started realizing that uh, I started seeing things in the horizon. I started seeing artificial intelligence, offshoring, outsourcing. And I said, wow, I, I, and, and it was almost like my dreams were shattered. That's what usually happens when you're young. You start to realize that the world's not mm-hmm. what you thought it was. So and then so I studied political science university. I, before that, I had some I obtained some information technology certificates Then I was working part time at a at a university in the in southwestern Ontario. That's where I was born, southwest, southwestern Ontario, near Detroit, Michigan. And so I started studying these things and I started working part time as a computer consultant. And uh, and I started seeing all these like I, these items that I mentioned, artificial intelligence and and offshoring and outsourcing. And and, the, and 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 that's where my my health issues. I've always had those since I was a young young person, but I I just kind of let it slide, I, and I didn't know what to do. And so I had all these people, mainly females in my life, talking about you know holistic this, holistic that. They would go to chiropractors and massage therapists, and they weren't acting or looking any better. So just confusing to me. So I just I I just kind of let it go until I eventually went into the doctor's office and asked you know uh, for for medication, and they put me on medication and. 
I said, okay, these seem to be working and they did, but then you start getting more, more and more side effects. And that's the kind of thing that's happening with the economy and everything we see now, the politicians are just using um, band-aid approaches to, to virtually everything and they're not fixing anything. And they just kind of kick the can down the road. And now we're starting to see the results of that. So, and then I started, I, I, um, I after university, I, uh, um, in my IT certifications, I started traveling across the country looking for any work I could find. And I was getting work in, in, uh, in, in call centers and in office settings. And then, and then I didn't see much dip, of a difference between office settings and call centers because I was starting to see in, I, in IT like 15, 20 years ago that they were outsourcing and offshoring a lot of work. And I'm just like, how is this possible? They're, they're getting all these people from other countries to work for even programmers and even like high level people. Uh, and I said, how is this possible? How is this sustainable? So I started to really question everything. So that's, and, uh, and I did more traveling. I taught English overseas as well. And I started doing a lot more studying. I started hearing about people, Ron Paul in the 2008 election, the big market crash we had back then. I started, I started thinking, wow, this is scary stuff. <laughs> it's nothing like, yeah. it's nothing like my parents taught me or nothing like anybody taught me. And I started saying, I'm on my own. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And, and this is also the same similar, you know, learning journey for me, you know, I was, you know, by degree, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I never understood finance or economy before. I mean, we have studied some subjects, but I was not really into it. Uh, but I always had some sort of a curiosity in terms of, you know, how does how does this whole banking system work? You know, how does this money and you know, it flows into economy? You know, who controls it? You know, how the banks print the money, you know, all that stuff. And and in the past, I was I should say six seven years, I started studying into it, and I that really opened my mind in terms of understanding the world from that lens, uh, how the geopolitical uh, you know uh, system works, because it's all centered about the money creation and who controls the money. So that really opened my my mind and my exposure. So now I understand things much better than what I used to uh, back then. So totally understand that. So um, you mentioned that you know. There were there were some issues with regards to getting employed in Canada, right? Because you were seeing the the, the 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 number of jobs being outsourced, even though if it's a managerial you know opportunity, uh, people were actually working for, you know from outside of, of Canada uh, for the companies. So was that the only factor that you think? Okay, there is no future for me in Canada. Maybe I should try it better somewhere else or are there other factors as well oh the housing situation yeah i was renting rooms when i when i uh, was going to other cities to looking for work i would rent a room because i didn't know if i was going to be i don't know what was going to happen so i didn't want to especially 10 years even 10 years ago the rent was crazy so i didn't sorry if this honking there's there's a lot of noise in this area okay. uh, i didn't know what to do so i just renting rooms and then uh, uh that was a factor because i'd get things stolen by other roommates and there's a lot of a lot of people in my similar similar situation is very common, so that's what the, the, the housing it's the housing issue and then the the the, the uh, health issue didn't know what to do, and so I and I heard all these things about uh, food and magical supplements for thirty years from my my mother my mother was sick my father was sick but he just thought that was in left field he thought it was like bonkers he thought the doc the only people that can help you is a doctor because that's what his probably his friends told him, so. The housing issue and, and the, the medical issue and then um, yeah and the, the social issue as well and trying to meet people yeah. it's very difficult yeah yeah so a lot of people especially the new immigrants they value the free healthcare in canada you you think completely otherwise even 10 years 10 years ago it's good now. it's good for acute issues it's good it's we should call it sick care not health care we should call it sick care because it's only when mainly when you get sick it's then it's mainly based on acute issues if you are an investor in the US and Canada or in Europe and you are considering investing into Dubai real estate market, this video is for you because we have a platform called Stake which allows you to invest into the residential real estate market and start earning rental income right away without going through a lengthy documentation process or coming up with a heavy down payment. Stake is built upon this the concept of crowdfunding so it is democratizing the entire investment strategy and, and allows you to own a single unit of the entire investment portfolio so you don't have to own the entire property right? you can be part of the pool that can actually own a piece of property a piece of real estate so that allows you to start with as low as 2000 dirhams and you can slowly ramp up so as you start investing into it you can not only own a bit of Bit of real estate but you also get a portion of the rental income 
on a monthly basis. So it's a passive investment strategy, diversifying your portfolio from traditional North American or European markets into Dubai, which is hustling and bustling and growing very fast and allows you to build your wealth over time. So, so don't delay. There is a link down there in the description. If you click on this, it will give you free 200 dirhams in your account right away to start with and you can thank me later. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, so, and, and that actually got you into this whole new gig that you're working on in terms of, you know, creating this uh, health consulting type of company. Like, tell us more about, you know, what what are you offering as part of your business to to anybody in Canada or outside Canada? And, and, and what actually got you into it? I grew up around entrepreneurship. My, my father was into, into entrepreneurship. And I started, I, I had a, a website about 15 years ago um, that I, I was running online and I, uh, I was making, I was making, uh, I was mainly affiliate marketing and that type of thing. It was an experiment. So, and then, um, <clears throat> that kind of broke down. And then I went, uh, I went back to a school, uh, a public school, and it was mainly international students there that didn't speak English, didn't have the certifications that they claimed. I talked to them and I said, what is going on here? And the, and the, and the instructors told me they shouldn't be here. They, that's, they said in front of the whole class. So this is about six years ago. So this, but this issues with, with the international students going on, uh, uh, um, the the scandal going on has been a long time. Uh, when I actually started my uh, part-time university position, they told me they wanted more locals working there because they had too many international students working th these places. So they knew that long ago. So anyway, I uh, about five years ago, I, I said to myself, I, I might as I discovered the truth, like the main root um, modality that was involved with biochemistry, the body and how your body behaves and uh, epigenome and genetics and things like that. So that was five years ago. So uh, because I, I used my experience, my entrepreneur, my entrepreneurial experience uh, with marketing, affiliate marketing and website creation to launch this idea that I'm having now. So and I, I'm, I'm barely even started yet. And Okay. I'm not even. I'm, I'm almost finished the school program for it. And these days, you have to get a school. You have to go to school for everything because if you don't, then you have to get a certification. If you don't, then people won't believe what you're saying. Yeah, I think it's more than that. I think the government won't allow you to practice. It's more about uh, the regulations and, and and control than anything. Because I think if you look into uh, other countries, people can. If you know something, you can start offering services. Of course, you know uh, there there has to be some. Uh, you know, concerned about the health and safety, but outside of the healthcare, you know, if you know something, you can start, you know, offering your offering your help uh, from day one. So, okay, so so what is what is your offer as part of your program? Like, what are you offering? Are you offering therapies or uh, some sort of a medication or you know what what is the actual end product? I I would be classified as a holistic nutritionist, but I'm trying to redefine that because nutrition is not only food, and that's what I thought it was. That's why I, I thought it was just trivial. I said, "Oh, so eat some, eat some, eat some oranges, and you'll be fine." And I said, "How is this going to solve somebody with, with cancer or like the major depression or whatever?" And I said, and, and "So the, I cannot legally treat or diagnose conditions. Only a medical doctor or or, or, or a Western medical person can do that. They, that's their title. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing they can. That's that, that's that's what they're legally allowed to do. I can't do that. These types of things, but." I do individualized assessment of your lifestyle, biochemistry, and it's very powerful. Uh, what you put in your mouth, uh, you you wouldn't you wouldn't realize, but you might need more vitamin C than you, or you might need more of these nutrients than you can get by mouth. And we don't realize that. I didn't really really realize that. So it's really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. So, so in terms of your end product, do you offer like consulting sessions to those patients and analyzing their, their lifestyle, their eating habits, their sleeping habits? And that's how you recommend that they should change something, uh, following some sort of like a, like a script or anything like, you know, what's, what's your recommendation? I have them fill out a f forms at the beginning and I, and I do physical observations and these are symptomatology forms and it might sound benign, but it's not and then from these forms, I get, uh, I can, I output a graph and I show you uh, all the elements in your body, organ function, uh, what's sluggish, what's not, what's overactive and, mm -hmm. and without, uh, without blood work, but blood work helps, but blood work is only a snapshot in time. Uh, so a lot of people will say, what's the science behind this is that it's, it's, it's systems biology, it's, it's system science or holistic science. Western medicine is mainly based on reductionism. Reductionism means they reduce the body to its component parts 
for easier study and, and mainly for only treating symptoms. And doctors will send you to a specialist and they'll, they'll only target those parts of your body for treating symptoms and symptom management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the role of pharma into this whole thing? Like, you know, you, you, you complain about, I should have complain. You, you highlighted the issues with regards to the healthcare system in Canada or in general in the Western society. How do you see the role of big pharma in there? It still has a role, but it has gone overboard in the past 50 years. And it has leaned toward too much of the reductionist side of medicine. Instead of attacking the germ when you get sick, instead of waiting to that, for that to happen, how about we try to prevent that? We try to make the terrain of the body. Remember, we're mostly water. So try to make mm. the terrain, the cells of your body optimal. So you're, there's terrain model of disease and there's the germ model of disease. So you try to make the body optimal environment so it, the germs or pathogens do not uh, take hold. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, so this is, I always try to understand better. And I'm, I'm always curious about, you know, back in the days, let's say, even before my time, even before my parents' time, there was no pharma, right? And people used to get sick, they used to get you know, better as well by using the natural, you know, whatever they have available in terms of like, you know, herbs or, or, or natural treatment. I think in the in the last 50, 60 years, when we have seen the rise of big pharma companies, now everything is just, you know, drugs. You know, if you get sick, you, you must take drugs, you know, whether this is Tylenol or, uh, or paracetamol or antibiotics, there's no other, there's, there's no other choice. You know, that that is becoming a norm now. And I always think, you know, this was not like this you know, 50, 60 years ago, like some something has happened to change the entire system in terms of how we treat, you know, diseases. Uh, and, and we completely now rely on these drugs. And, and, and of course, there are some theories behind that as well. And people will, will call conspiracy theories here. Uh, but, but the role of big, big pharma is, is beyond that, you know, issuing the drugs. There's a lot of, you know, money thing, financing th things behind it and how they basically create, you know, lobbies with the government. Um, we know that this whole COVID thing, you know, what happened, um, in the last, in the last four years. Uh, so that's why I always, you know, try to understand much better in terms of how this whole big pharma game works behind the scene. Um, so now you are in Ecuador, right? So why why Ecuador? Like, you know, there are a lot of countries, you know, um, in South America or even in Europe as well. Why did you choose Ecuador? Yeah, I, do, I actually do have a European passport, but I never used it because I, I view, I haven't been there, but my understanding is that the Western world is, there's too much bureaucracy involved in everything. And the, the, the banks are, are not, they're not, they're not, they're not encouraging, they're not encouraging saving. They've been encouraging spending consumption for the past 25 years since around 9-11. So, and the weather here is much, is much more hospitable than Canada. The, the, it's, it's roughly room temperature, a little bit warmer than that almost every day. And they use the U.S. dollar here. And, oh, nice. Yeah, and, and the people see, here appear to be hospitable to foreigners. They, they actually desire people to come here to uh, set, set up roots. And, and like I said, in Canada, it's 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 very anti-human in the Western world, but in Canada especially, it's a very, in my opinion, it's a very anti-human, anti anti, it's a very anti-human environment. Uh, they 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 appear to they've been doing this for a long time. They 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 over they overregulate, they overtax, they they take it, they don't pay you any interest in the bank. Uh, you're you're basically yeah. living hand to hand to mouth, and it's it, and you get sick, you're going to get sick, and then when you go to the doctor, you get sicker. And the food we have is expensive. It's not available. It should be everywhere. We should have healthy food everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so let's let's talk about this whole thing. So I think over regulation and, and, and over taxation is definitely something that we are all seeing not right now. Like regulation has been a problem in Canada for almost you know forever. Uh, but these things, you know, whenever you see new projects get started, there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy and regulation that somebody has to go through. I was watching one of the videos uh, interview from um, Kevin O'Leary, and I also reference him uh, onto my channel as well. And, and he was he was absolutely, you know, right. And he was basically, you know, telling the, the Canadians, you know, the reason why we are not getting any investment in Canada is because of this red tape. There's a lot of bureaucracy, regulations, um, 
like it takes forever to get a permit. He he was in data center business, right? So because of the AI boom, he was he was investing into a lot of new data centers and a lot of capital is actually moving into years for the same reason because it's much easier to get the permits you know issued and get the project started like within a matter of like six or eight weeks in the US versus in Canada it can take months uh, if not years um, and and that's why you know the investors are actually uh, dropping this idea of you know investing into Canada even though Kevin is Canadian himself and of course he wants to invest in Canada but because the system is not built to incentivize the investors they're not coming here so and it, it goes into pretty much every single industry you look at telecoms there's a lot of oligarchs and monopoly you know you only have three providers the, as soon as the fourth provider comes out it get acquired <laughs> uh, right same goes with the banking system you only have five big banks you know nobody can survive except them if, if an international bank comes uh, comes comes in Canada like HSBC, you know they get they get bought bought off, right? They get acquired. So that's really the the story of Canada. You know, it's it's, it's oligarchs, it's monopoly. Um, that doesn't really create the environment for entrepreneurs like yourself, right? If you wanted to build something, a business, you have very limited options in Canada because of all these things. And I'm not bashing Canada here at all. I'm just highlighting the issues the entrepreneurs and solopreneurs they face this issue here in canada that's the reason why people like you leave canada and try your luck elsewhere either in the us or in, in, in any another country because they're so anti um anti you know innovation right you can you can innovate things at the university but bringing the idea from a university into the commercial field it's a process and it takes a lot of effort and investment and and help from the government bodies we don't we don't see that that last last mile of that process in Canada uh, any any easier. So what is your um, what is your plan in terms of you know taking this whole new business to the next step? Like what's your commercial model and how you want to scale this up in the future? I'm trying to perform marketing to a limited extent at this time, and I'm trying to appeal to people through shows like this. It, when you when you look at it, when you look at all the all the measurements, even the blood measurements and even the tissue measurements, like I do hair mineral analysis and, and live blood cell analysis, when you look at all these things, even the test, the limited test that doctors run, you see that most of us in the Western world, especially in Canada, where clinic most of us are clinic subclinically sick, and that's a big reason why that the government, um, the, the 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 public public bureaucracy has become so large. Uh, they don't trust us enough to do our own thing. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying that they take this this factor into account, but if that's the base root of it, most of us are subclinically sick on many levels. So we don't. We don't trust the government. Doesn't trust us. We don't trust it. We we, we start losing. We stop losing trust in, in, in interactions with others. So you started to see that now. Yeah. Can you explain this subclinically sick means? You know, for the audience, there's many. There are many symptoms. Sub subclinical symptoms. That in our daily life that, that we don't see that we don't we don't obtain these kind of assessments at a doctor's office, uh, the smell our smell uh, our black under black black blackness under our eyes, uh, white spots in our fingernails, uh, graying of hair, art of, uh, uh, um, quickening of aging, we, all these things that we consider normal, even cavities. We go to the dentist. We think we need we think we need. Uh, employment that my, my parents put this in my mind. They think we need employment, employer health benefits to keep well. I said, no, your employer is going to drive your health to the ground <laughs> and, they, and they don't give you proper health care uh, by insurance. I mean, this is just crazy. So yeah, these symptoms that I showed that I told you and others like lack of energy and, and then we drink energy drinks thinking that's going to solve our problem. That's basically just a bandaid. That's not addressing mm -hmm. the, 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 the internal pond of your body, why you're getting sick or why you're getting a lack of energy yeah. and all these things translate to the gdp of the of the of the nation oh of course of course if if, if the uh if the population is not mentally and physically healthy then of course it will reflect into the economic output as well what do you see the role of drinking water in all this that you just mentioned i recently discovered the the quality of drinking water here in canada is is very poor even though i i believe all the time you know canada has the largest lakes and the rivers in the world and we just should have, you know, the healthiest water in this country. But that is far from from the reality now. Um, can you just explain to the audience, you know, what is the quality of water here in Canada? And, and funny enough, I actually worked at a water plant as a summer student uh, long ago. 
And it's mainly that it's, it's the lack that the infrastructure has not been maintained for 50 years. The, the pipes that distribute all the water is, are garbage. So everyone, yeah. there are so many people that, that claim they have, okay, how do I say this? There are many people I've encountered over the years that have a socialist mindset, if I want to call it that. And they say, well, the water is the best in Canada. I said, who, who said, who tells them that? Have they ever visited a water plant? What they put in the water, how, how it's manufactured all these all these factors they they haven't they they're just they're basically just repeating things like parrots so mm -hmm. the, the water quality you if you compare it to ecuador and other places you could say that maybe the water quality the municipal water quality it could be better or it could be better in canada you still need to use a water filter wherever you go uh, i would not be drinking consuming the same water that i flush my toilet with anywhere even mm -hmm. in canada that's 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 a big factor in uh, anywhere it, the water it, we're mainly composed of water like i said yeah 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 i recently discovered this whole water quality issue because uh, I, I live part of these you know uh, southern ontario where the water is really hard and and we must deploy basically the water softener in order to make that water usable and even after getting the water softener done you still need the reverse osmosis process to kind of make it more filtered water and i was using a provider i, I, I cannot name that on the channel and i have the system installed since i bought this property but even after that the water is not really uh, to the levels where it should be considered uh, safe to drink Right. And I did not know that I had one of the guy came to my property to test the water and it was I was shocked, you know, how bad that water quality was compared to what was sold to me from a, from a provider that, you know, this system will actually make your water much, much better to drink. Um, and I can say 90 percent of the people have no idea what they're drinking. Right. Even from the bottled water that you buy from the store, that's also garbage. Like that's not also not a drinkable. I mean, it's a drinkable water, but it doesn't have the stuff that you the thing it should have. Like it, it has a lot of chemicals, um, you know, a lot of chlorine, fluorine that is not really good for our health anyway. So that's another topic that I want to discuss on my channel to educate people, you know, how how to kind of, you know, improve your water quality. And and before that, I think we you have to understand, you know, what goes into the water that we drink, right? The water that comes to you uh to your property through this distribution system it has a lot of chemicals um and and you should understand what those chemicals are and how those chemicals are affecting your health uh, your skin you know um and then in and and of course the finance side of it because that water when you wash it your body your your house you clean your house your, your dishes that consumes a lot of you know soap as well right because if the water is hard and then it has a lot of chemicals, it takes a lot of soap in order to mix with it and then and, and does it do its job in terms of cleaning it. If the water quality is good, you shouldn't need a lot of soap. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, hard water. Yeah, the, yeah the, there's a, there's a there's a reason why we have uh, so many problems with high blood pressure and cardiovascular issues. It's not only the food; it's also the water. So water that is hard water is high and. The water hardness is, is defined by the, uh, the amount of calcium and magnesium. So we don't often obtain the correct forms of magnesium and the correct forms of calcium. So when mm -hmm. we get too much of, of certain minerals, especially our arteries, our body and our, and our arteries, our, our tissues start to become, literally become, uh, they start to harden, so Decay, become yeah. less flexible. So exactly. the, water, the water quality is also a factor. And uh, when I worked, this might sound conspiratorial, conspiratorial as well, because many people have heard these, 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 these strange things, but it's not actually floor. It's not actually mainly fluoride. It's a different form of fluoride that comes from uh, the production of, 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 of uh, substances, uh, harmful substances in, 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 um, in industrial manufacturing. They put sodium, um, what is it called? Hydro, I can't even pronounce it, hydrofluorocytic acid. It's an acid and it has fluoride mm -hmm. in it, but... Yeah, these yeah. all these things affect how we think and how we be how our health manifests. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, Dave, thanks for all this information. Uh, I think the audience will will like it and 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 find it more beneficial for them. So, what are your plans in terms of uh, coming back to Canada? Do you see any hopes in terms of getting Canada better in the next five to ten years? You know, something happened magically and then things start getting better. What's your what's your forecast? I mean, I don't want to stay here. I, I would rather be I'd rather stay in the country I grew up in, but it's not the country I grew up in anymore. And if I return to Canada, 
uh, this I'm serious. I would I would buy a cargo van and turn it into a, a, a mini apartment because I can't I can't I I no longer have relatives to stay with, so I would have to set up my own. Therefore, I'd have to set up my own accommodations, and right. and, and living in an apartment in Canada, and not only the cost, but you have to ask that the. the the, the bureaucracy is so high that you have to even ask the landlord for permission to hang a, a picture on a wall. Yeah. And not only that, you know, there's a lot of other expenses that comes along with that, right? You know, you're talking about the renting, but if you, let's say, if you buy a property, you have to pay uh, land transfer tax, you have to pay uh, municipality tax, you know, uh, you have to pay uh, other taxes that comes along with that. So uh, even though if you outright own the property, you really don't own the property because you have to pay property taxes. As soon as you stop paying property, ta property taxes, your property will be confiscated. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and but if, if you buy a car, you have to pay, you have to pay the, the transfer fee. And then if you sell it, the, the other person has to pay the transfer tax. I mean, it's just, this is, this is what this was, this was so unbelievable for me because I, I, I lived in UK for 12 years. I think in pretty much in Europe, you don't pay tax on a used car. Like that was a very common sense thing in the UK and the Europe. When I came to Canada, that was the shocker for me to realize when you pay, when you buy a used car, even if it's a 15 years old used car, you have to pay tax to the government. <laughs> but why? Because the, the person who purchased the, you know, that car from the, from the manufacturer, they have already paid taxes on this. Why somebody has to pay taxes for a used commodity each time they, they, they exchange hands? This is unbelievable. Many, many people that want to come to Canada, I hear it here. I hear it in this place all the time. Ecuadorians, I hear them all the time saying they want to go to Canada. Uh, and I hear them say there's all kinds of free things involved. And I'm not, I'm not disparaging them. I would do the same. I was considering going yeah. to Germany with my European passport because I heard that they have free tuition. But then I started thinking to myself, I said, who is paying for all this stuff? And and like we were saying, we're we're talking about uh, all the all the fees you pay for used cars and all these details that that we don't hear about. And you you only hear the rosy picture. You only hear the the positive things about Canada. And, and and a lot there's not enough critical thinking going on. And I see these stories from how these international students they say they got scammed. They said, are they not are they not going to take any responsibility for their life? Are they always going to play the victim? Yeah, Holy exactly, exactly. I mean, at the at the end of the day. The taxpayer, tax, you know, bears a burden. You know, whatever you you get, quote unquote, free uh, in country, it's all coming from the taxpayer's pocket. Um, and I think one of the one of the challenge that we have in Canada is uh, those taxes are not going to get lower. Right? They are only going to get up um, over the time because there's something called unfunded liabilities, which includes healthcare and pension. The government needs to have the influx of new money coming into these funds in order to pay the boomers for their retirement and their health care. So they need people. I think a lot of, okay, immigration is definitely a, an issue here because over immigration is, is not going to help. But the government needs to have taxes coming in from these immigrants to fund those unfunded liabilities. That's that's their that's their game plan, right? If they, if they don't... Exactly. If they don't bring immigrants, there's not enough taxes coming into the into the pool, which is not going to fund the healthcare and the retirement and the old old age pension. That needs to be funded. It's not funded. The government needs this Ponzi scheme to get going before, you know, it collapses. I think that's really the problem, and a general general public doesn't understand that, and that's really the reason why they keep, you know, bringing immigrants. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, you know, yeah, yeah. Finish your thought. Yeah, the the Ponzi scheme it is collapsing, and and when it does, I think we're going to see a revaluation of currencies. There's going to be there's going to be major strife because the countries that are going to get shafted, they're going to get shortchanged. They're not going to be happy. <laughs> so yeah, when, once they start saying we we have to we have to adopt maybe a, a Bitcoin based currency or 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 a metal based currency, and then uh, somebody gets shortchanged, there's going to be a world war or something going on. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially uh, this, this whole you know global reserve currency for U.S. dollar. Uh, yes, some countries are kind of you know diverting away from it, uh, but of course the U.S. won't let it happen before a, a big war, right? So that's really uh, that's really the the reality. Uh, and I think countries like Canada, where their currency is not the global reserve currency, we are at the mercy of the foreign exchange market, right? So, and we're seeing because of all these 
economical issues, lower GDP and, and high deficit spending, the Canadian dollar is keep falling against USD. Um, and that is also, you know, uh, basically affecting our quality of life here because everything gets expensive and your currency gets cheaper against the other currencies because we import a lot of stuff here, right? And we pay uh, in terms of the exchange that is set by the by the market. And if you look at Canadian dollar, it's keep falling. It's keep falling against USD. And I think it is expected to keep fall because of all the economical issues we have. And, and the more it falls, the, the more expensive the things are going to be for us because we don't produce a lot of stuff here in Canada. We import, uh, you know, especially the food, um, which is coming from other countries like California, uh, U.S., Mexico, and, and other countries. So it's it's unfortunate for sure. Uh, but I think uh, to 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 finish on a good note, I think Canada is still one of the uh, one of the better places in the world. Like there's a lot of you know bad places in the world where people are suffering in terms of the basic human rights and and education and food. Uh, I mean, I should, I wanted, I just wanted to, you know, finish this on a good note that Canada is still one of the best places. We have some challenges. Um, and I think that those challenges needs, you know, hard decisions to, to, to fix them. And I think looking at politicians, if they're going to magically solve these issues is, is a, uh, is a par- fool's paradise. Politicians cannot solve this. I think it, it has to be solved by the private market. Uh, they have to deregulate some stuff here in Canada so that the, the, the free market can figure it out. Like in, in the history, we have seen the private companies, the private market has been coming up with those solutions. And then the market, you know, finds the price itself. You know, you don't have to regulate each and everything. You know, this price, this product has to be priced that way. The market can figure it out. Like it's all simple demand and supply. And if, if we let the free market to to work, it can find solutions. And, and as a society, as a whole, we get, we get better over time. Uh, so I just wanted to you know finish this on a, on a better note to to not to offend a lot of Canadians. <laughs> yeah, we need to fix the the food supply. We need to have more more quality food available everywhere, and we need to we need to fix the currency. Because everything is dependent on these things. Absolutely, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So thanks, Dave. Uh, this is very insightful. Uh, I hope uh, all 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 the good luck for your for your new gig. Um, I hope you know things get better for you, and, and you you come back to Canada at some point. Um, but I understand the challenges you're facing. So good luck with that. At least uh, um, a, a possibility of getting work, but it's just how long you're going to keep it. And you might need to work remote and you might still need to get the, you still need to get the, you still need to get the, uh, the thing in your arm. Mm. Of, of course, of course. Yeah, we, we, we can, we cannot talk about that because my channel gets shut down immediately. <laughs> um anyway thanks uh thanks dave um yeah wish you good luck and yeah we can uh, we can connect uh, sometime later take care are you a non-us tax resident and looking to open a business in the us well this video is very important for you so watch it till the end basically if you are a non-us tax resident which means you don't have ssn which which is your tax identification number which means when you open a bank account or you open a stripe account or paypal account or amazon business account or any business account you need your ssn number in order to open any of these accounts in the us well if you are a non-us tax resident which means you don't have ssn with you you can have another identification which is called itin so itin is similar nine digit number which is used for tax purposes if you are a non-us tax resident so whenever you apply for a business account or bank account or payment processing account like paypal or stripe or even amazon fps seller or registering a business in the us you can use itin instead of ssn this will help you to set up all of these things even though you're not a u.s tax resident so if you're in canada latin america europe uk australia or anywhere in the world you can apply for itin and you can use itin to register a business open up the business accounts open up the payment processing account in the us and pretty much do all the tax related stuff using itin even though you don't have ssn one of the unique use cases for itn is if you are a non-tax resident but you have a us-based income 
like for example you have a rental property in the US or any other business that is generating income from the US then depending upon the tax treaty from your parent country you may have to file taxes in the US right so when you have to file taxes in the US you need ITIN because you have to file your tax return on a form 1040 NR okay so if you are a non-tax resident you need the form 1040 NR in order to file your tax return and when you fill out that form you will be required to enter your ITIN because you don't have SSN so in order to enter your tax identification number you have to have ITIN number ready okay this is a very common use case for all the non-tax resident that is generating income in the US they need to file tax return depending upon your tax treaty between your parent country you may need ITIN okay. as well so, so how do you get that well, there are some companies available on the internet that will help you to get you the ITIN, but they may charge between four to $600 per application. We have a company called ITIN and they are one of the quickest in terms of submitting the application. So they will help you out in terms of collecting the documentation, help you out in terms of answering your questions, and help you out in terms of submitting the application. Now, the typical application process times takes between four to 14 weeks, but the ITIN people only take 48 hours to collect the information, help you out in the journey, submit your application and from that point onwards it's basically irs irs can take between 2 to 12 weeks depending upon their volume of the applications but throughout the process they will handhold you in terms of opening up the accounts help you to open up the fba account or stripe account or paypal account or guide you in terms of the entire process they're pretty quick to respond they have people speaking english and spanish and arabic and they can give you very competitive rates as well plus if you use my referral link which will give you extra 50 dollar discount when you purchase their services so if you are looking to open a business in the us start your journey today apply for itin even though if you're not looking to open a business now you should have itin just in case in the future if you want to open a business you're ready from tax standpoint so check the link in the description below and let's get back to the video